because it is now available for download as a PDF. So the pre-release material for the Friday, the 19th of May, 2023 exam for global information. And this is what it looks like just here. So as always, uh, you cannot take your own copy of this into the exam. You can, however, do whatever you like with it in terms of preparing you. You can write on it, you can highlight it, you can convert it to a Word document, add comments to it, which I would recommend that you do. But you can't take this copy in the exam. You will, however, be given a clean copy of it along with the exam paper on the day of the exam. So, it is about an island hopping holiday um, company. It looks okay. There are quite a lot of clues in this case study in terms of what kind of questions you're likely to be asked in section A of the exam. So we can see here that it's this imaginary company PHIH and we're told that they operate ferries between the Greek islands of Thessalonica, Rhodes, Mykonos, Santorino. The ferries call at different Greek islands where passengers can leave or join uh, and just hop off and on and you buy a ticket for that either for a single journey or for a round trip um, and so straight away we have to start thinking about well if we're buying tickets how does that work um, there's obviously going to be questions around the security of the data you're probably going to have to sign up for some kind of account put your credit card details in so there may be questions around the obfuscation of the credit card information the encryption of the data in the database and so on so if we keep reading it'll tell us a little bit more about it it tells us that each of these islands has a port the ferries leave and arrive at these ports like they do at ports all over the world a simple itinerary is shown here in this table and ferry tickets can be bought in advance on their online booking web page so there may be questions about the kinds of information that can be stored um, used displayed on a web page there may be questions about forms on web pages about how you can validate the input in those forms on those web pages for example we're told that tickets can be posted or they can be sent in a e-ticket form via an email address or downloaded to a digital device now that prompts some thoughts about downloaded to a digital device so we know in the specification there's a list of digital devices um, and there's ca characteristics uh, categories we know that that could mean a laptop or a smartphone or a tablet and we know that each of these devices comes with different operating systems different amounts of storage um, different you know means of connection to the internet of a 4g or 5g or of a wi-fi and encrypted uh, uh, vpns and things like that so there may be questions about the different types of devices that could be used to um, download these e-tickets for example it tells us that when tickets are booked the following details are required the number of passengers the name and the contact details the passport number the journey details the payment details and ticket type so this is going to be stored on some server most likely a, a web server somewhere in an SQL database there could be questions about um, the nature of that server in terms of the connection to it in terms of the security of that server in terms of the encryption of the data at rest and in terms of the uh, the way that maybe the data in transit is also encrypted during the uh, booking process passengers input their email address these email addresses are then used to send information about special offers uh, discount codes uh, and, and so on bookings are stored in a database 
which has personal details and booking history for each passenger. Now that is covered by the GDPR. So there may be questions here about the law relating to the storage of personal information on computer systems. So you'll need to know the principles of the GPR and how that relates to this particular scenario. We're told that the database is stored on a server in the head office. There is a selection from the booking database. Now, the questions that come up on these kinds of things are to do with the information types, the data types, um, the information style. So they ask you questions about uh, whether it's text, whether it's number, whether it's Boolean. And we can clearly see here we've got check boxes. So we've got some Boolean things going on in here. We've got some text. We've got some numbers. OK, and sometimes even though it's not displayed here, they may ask you questions about what might be stored in this database because it is only a selection there may be extra columns that we can't see and sometimes they ask questions along the lines of what else would be a good thing to store in this database what other um, data types could be used in this database and the obvious one you know might be like a picture of the island for example uh, a picture of the ferry you, you might go on or, or, or a map or something like that. So sometimes they throw these questions in just to see if you understand it, even though you can't actually see it in this extract. So when booking passengers can select an option to have e-tickets, if they do not select this option, a further screen is shown so that you can put in your delivery address. So there might be questions here around the type of information in terms of its classification is it personal is it public is it private is it classified things like that okay if the e-tickets are selected then the page goes to a payment screen the cost of the ticket is calculated and delivery charges are added now there may be questions about how good this data is if these calculations are wrong if the delivery information is incomplete, if the delivery information is in, is somehow, uh, it's not been collected properly, it's got corrupted in transit, it's not saved properly, that's gonna cause all kinds of problems. If the schedule that they've published is out of date, if it's inaccurate, if there's some trouble going on at one of the ports that we don't know about, and we're allowing people to book tickets. So there's all kinds of potential problems with the data not being good up to date and valid. When international passengers place orders for tickets, the total price is shown in euro. So there's a conversion going on. So again, if the conversion rate is out of date, um, if the local currency is incorrect, there's, there's going to be problems. Um, and then it tells us that this information is displayed on the passenger's credit or debit card statement. The conversion from euros is based on the exchange rate for that day so it's a dynamic process every day it is um it is changing okay so these details are taken each morning at nine o'clock on the european central bank's website so what if you're using yesterday's conversion rate tickets are shown at each port and checked the passenger list shows that passengers leaving and joining so again if it's a problem with that ticket the ticket is inaccurate the dates on it are wrong, all kinds of problems for the passenger being able to get on the ferry, get off the ferry and go to the places that they paid to go to. Passenger lists are collated each morning. What if the passenger lists are wrong? What if someone's name's missed off the list? Okay, and that's done by the admin staff. The information is taken from the information created when the passengers book their journeys. This entire process is entirely reliant on everybody doing their job properly on the data being accurate. The passenger list is then emailed to each port. So again, we've got data in transit. Is there a requirement to protect that data? Should it somehow be protected? Should there be um, a mechanism in place 
so that they know that it's reached its destination, for example. PHP has a blog, okay? So again, we're into what kind of information can be displayed on a blog. We're told that the blog contains information about the journey, the ship, and the route. So the, the, you know, they could ask you questions about displaying a map, for example, maybe uh, some uh, GPS so that in real time you can see where the ferry is at any given moment so you know if it's running on time or if it's a bit late or or, 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 or you know whatever it might be tells us the blog is written by a member of the ferry staff the blogs also include text images and video so there may be questions about how this text image and video can maybe be more accessible for people could there be subtitles on that video for example phih has just introduced podcasts so again, another um, you know type of information there. Uh, so we've got a podcast. So again, there could be questions about the accessibility of that podcast. Is it is it a video podcast? Is it just an audio podcast? Each podcast shows the journey between two island ports with a commentary in the Greek language. Subtitles are available for different languages, and an online translating service translates commentary now some of these online translating services they're notoriously terrible at translating from other languages so again there might be questions about issues that might arise if the, the translation is not maybe as accurate as it could be okay so the exam board are always helpful in uh, the sense that they provide us with topics to go and revise and they are listed at the end of this document to prepare for the exam research these following themes categories of information information holders information styles and sources and we've already seen various places where we might get asked questions about who has the information and what category does it fit in and what style might it be and where does it come from? How different information formats are used, including advantages and disadvantages. So we've already been told about um, email lists and itineraries and uh, various things on websites like booking pages. And we've been told about podcasts and we've been told about the contents of blogs and videos and so on. The characteristics of the quality of the information that is not only collected but also stored and processed. The global information protection legislation. So I can't see anything in this that is outside of the European Union. So the main protection legislation is going to be the GDPR. Um, they may refer to the Computer Misuse Act. Sometimes they will just ask you a random question about one of the other laws just to see whether you know uh, what those laws are. So if it doesn't come up in Section A, there's nothing to stop them asking questions about those things in Section B of the paper. How different physical and logical protection measures can be used? So, again, there's lists of these in the specification, and you do need to know the difference between what the exam board define as physical, such as you know the biometrics, the uh, physical locks, um, door locks, number locks um, on on a server room doors and things like that, um, and the logical protection measures, which are generally the things that refer to you know a piece of software, such as it could be a software firewall, um, antivirus, anti malware. Um, again, if you look in the specification, there are very specific lists of items um, that they have um, put in there. So you can see what they mean by physical and what they mean by logical protection measures. So that's the case study. Uh, hopefully, you know, um, you'll be OK in the exam. I would suggest you open this in Word, save yourself a copy of it um, in a Word document. Get yourself a copy of the specification, uh, line this up side by side, go through the spec 
and make comments on the document so that you can begin to make the connection between the lists of items that are in the spec and the things that they're mentioning in this case study so hopefully in your mind you can begin to see these are the kind of things they might ask me about when I get to this particular part of the case study.